Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody's having a great start to your week. I hope that everything is going the way that you uh, anticipated. If not, remember what I always say. If you're still breathing, you're still in the fight. Um, this is something that I promised you guys that I was going to start doing this week and that was going to be weekly series on topics that have to do with uh, the current state of black America, uh, the enigmatic issues and problems that plague our communities and stifle our desired progress towards uh, liberation and empowerment. This week's series we did, yesterday we did part one and two. Uh, today we're going to do part three and four of the miseducation of black youth in America. Um, and I am excited about it. Before we get started, I need to remind you, if you believe in the work that I and my organization, The Odyssey Project, has done over the past 30 years, uh, we need your support. We need you. Yes, the likes and the shares and the comments are all great and they're encouraging, but we need your support. The level of uh, resources necessary to conduct research, to do program development, program implementation, advocacy, uh, resource centers for mental health, resource centers for domestic violence, resource centers for um, things like uh, childhood sexual abuse and incest. So many things that we've done for more than 30 years and we have definitely done with a great level of intensity for the last 20 we need your support. So look in the description box and click the link and give. This is my challenge to you. We can talk all day until we're blue in the face. If we don't take action, if we don't come together, if we don't unify, it's all just talk. And on that note, look, I'm going to start out uh, this particular session we're going to do uh, today. You're going to get to see... Um, Parts three and four of the miseducation of black youth in America. Uh, I'm going to start. I'm only going to read two excerpts today. I'm going to read from my 24th book, Academic Apartheid. And then I'm going to read from my 19th book, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. Okay. Uh, this subtopic uh, from uh, Academic Apartheid is entitled the lack of cultural influence it says because blacks have no economic power we also lack the capacity to positively impact our culture whether you examine the tv shows that pervade our culture or the music in constant rotation you will find negative messages subliminally inculcated into the black psyche according to tom burrell author of brainwash challenging the myth of black inferiority it is propaganda uh, it is the propaganda mechanism of mass media that has consistently perpetuated the negative image of black inferiority and other negative stereotypes associated with being black. Look at what Burrell has to say about propaganda and its influence on black culture. Propaganda is the outer layer of this brainwashing onion. It is the marketing world. In the marketing world, propaganda is the first tool of persuasion. Brainwashing is the outcome but propaganda is what got us here and it is and its continued use keeps the inferior superior mind game in play instead of using torture or other corrosive techniques the stealthy media savvy propagandist uses mass media and other forms of communication to change minds and more ways of thinking i have no intention on shying away from the term propaganda i say we use it I say we take what is thrown at us, shuck it off, and replace it with proper, with positive propaganda. And this short uh, excerpt from uh, book number 19, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. Um, it says, most of what blacks believe is the result of a reality that has been accomplished by either obscure what most of what blacks believe is the result of a reality that has been accomplished by either obscuring the truth withholding or hiding history and the dissemination of false propaganda we must invest the time and energy into conducting in-depth research for the purpose of discovering the totality of who we are as a people we must then be willing to rewrite the narrative of the black existence we must be willing to tell our story 
our way. We must learn to celebrate our genius, our beauty, and our power. We must abandon the need to apologize for our blackness because it makes others uncomfortable. Now, let's let's be clear here because I know that the topic is the miseducation of black youth in America. And normally when you talk about miseducation, the immediate uh, postulation or assumption is that we're talking solely about academic institutions. And I want to impress upon you this truth that uh, education is far more than the accumulation of academic skills. And it's an immensely important for us to understand that the education, uh, the process of educating our youth starts uh, the moment they enter into this world by the way we engage them, by the way we bond with them, by the way we hold them, by the environment we surround them with. And as they begin to develop the capacity to communicate the, the truths and the uh, level of identity and values and um, so much more that we inculcate into their psyche through repetition, through practice, and through their ability to observe us living it is what's going to be the most important years of their education. Again, by the time they enter into an academic institution, they should know who they are. And when they don't know who they are, it's easy to suggest to them uh, alternatives to the truth of power, of intelligence, of, of, of being beautiful, of being remarkable, of being capable of doing anything they desire to suggest to them that they are in many ways inferior to a specific group, i.e. whites. And so this is what this thing is about. So when Tom Burrell is talking about propaganda, and, and let me tell you something, in order to even have this discussion, what I suggest is everybody should have read at least two books to understand what's going on with media. Uh, the first book would be Propaganda, if I'm not mistaken, written in 1933 by Edward Bernays. Uh, it gives you a breakdown in, in detail of how propaganda is used to control the mindset, to control the narrative, uh, to produce idea suggestions, and to mold and manipulate how people move, how people think, and so forth. You gotta understand, it was Hitler's study of propagandists in the U.S. that allowed him to develop his propaganda campaign that convinced an entire nation that it was okay to kill Jews. And so you got to understand that this thing is extremely powerful and it starts early and it's in the music, it's in the television programming, it's in the social media content. It's constantly bombarding the mind and making suggestions that take hold within the sub subconscious. And so what we have to understand, it's our responsibility to, uh, with great intensity and great specificity, to offset what is being pushed upon us, as Tom Burrell would say, take it off and then replace it with positive propaganda. Because what we have to do is we have to reinforce uh, the data, the stimuli, the suggestions, the information that's constantly flowing that creates an idea uh, and an ex uh, a, a suggestive experience of being sub um sub capacity or sub capable of performing at the level of whites and if you look around you will see whites uh, dominate uh, when it dominate uh, when it comes to socioeconomic measurements uh, the racial wealth gap the median household wealth gap the earning wealth gap uh, the earning gap so many different places that we look at from us uh, in, in, in what is done in academia if we are not careful we will buy into the subliminal suggestions that we are naturally intellectually inferior uh, as a matter of fact the reason I ended up in psychology instead of law was the argument that blacks were somehow inherently intellectually inferior something that was being pushed in the late 70s and the early 80s and in 1985 i come home from school turn on television the phil donahue show is on and you guys guys have probably heard me tell this story before but the phil donahue show is on and on this show there's this black woman uh named dr francis Cress welsing and she's on this show at the time uh, defending her her dissertation, the Crest Theory of Color Confrontation, 
uh, against a, a panel of white males. And this black woman was holding her own. And now this is on the heels of the suggestion that blacks are intellectually inferior, yet she was giving them the business and she was able to do it from an intellectual, non-emotional perspective. And this was powerful to me. And I had always bounced between psychology and law. And at that day, that moment, I knew I was going into psychology because I was learning the power of suggestion. I was learning so much of what we do in behavior is it, it is something that's happening beneath the surface. It's the subconscious mind that's controlling 96% of what we do. That's why you can sit up and say, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to have. And you still struggle to get it because the idea is that willpower work. Willpower is a conscious mechanism. It's something you sit up and in a conscious level say, this is what I'm going to do. The problem is your conscious only controls about four to five percent of your total outcome. Most of this is going to come from your programming, which is your subconscious and what your children and our children as a whole are being uh, programmed is I'm less. I'm naturally violent. All I can do is this. I'm going to shake it. I'm going to pop it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to bang. I'm going to do this. It's, it's constantly. And then we talked about yesterday the disproportionality of special education, especially aimed at young black boys. So, again, I'm going to alienate the young black boy before he gets in because I understand the importance and connectivity to finishing school and developing a skill set capable of producing um, an earned income that can support a lifestyle. If I can get them out of school, then I increase their risk of becoming incarcerated. We know that any kid that does not graduate at least high school has a, especially males, ha have a five time more likely chance of becoming incarcerated. So then we must understand how all of these mechanisms are playing. But the programming starts even before they get to school. And so when we sit up and we say it's just entertainment, is it? Absolutely not, because why? The mind is being programmed on what's suggested. You want to know why it's so easy now to take lives? Because there are all these games where lives are being taken. You get killed, you start over. And nobody thinks about that. You know, you just you, you just got shot up, you start over. You just shot the person, you get back up, you start over, and you go again. Desensitization to violence. Then there are all these videos of violence. Then there is the exposure to violence. We talk about um, in great detail uh, in my lectures, in my books, when we're talking about the need for proper racial socialization of young black males. Uh, the importance of racial socialization in reducing what? African-American, adolescent, and young adult male violence. Why is it important? Because in the inner city, you have these mechanisms that literally lend to and uh, promote uh, abstract violent behavior. So what do you do? You have to sit up and understand what does it. A feeling of being disrespected. Well, no man feels more disrespected and marginalized than the black man. So it starts early because the little black kid, five years old, is already being targeted by the system in a weaponized uh, academic mechanism like special education to be alienated from the masses and separated and viewed differently and ostracized and treat it as less than before he ever even gets into third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. He's already hating being in an academic environment, not because he can't learn, but because he's been identified as problematic because he couldn't be still, because he talked out of place because of a number of different things that all kids at that age should actually be doing. Kids should not be demanded to be still at four, five, six, seven, eight years old. That's when they're learning. That's when they're active. They're learning through their activity. They're learning through their, their feeling, their touching, their talking, uh, uh, and, and asking questions, the idea, but see what they need and what they're developing and what they're creating is a more docile individual for the purpose of being able to control them. Now, this isn't isolated solely to the black community, but it's more prevalent in the black community because why? The people who control it are non-black. 83% of teachers in elementary level are white females who are who have a natural 
and I'll, and I'll repeat, who have a natural aversion to black males as early as five years old, they're already uncomfortable around black males. Now, we're not talking about little, little Bunny Becky who trying to nail down a black brother. We're talking about the average white woman is not and comfortable in the presence of a black male. All you got to do is pay attention when you're leaving or coming into the grocery store or to the mall or somewhere and the white lady is coming towards you and she starts to drift over, about to bump into cars and everything to get, get as far away from you as possible, clenching her purse because propaganda has told her that you're going to harm her. Because everything she sees in media about black males is that they're violent, they're hypersexual, and they have a natural bend toward criminality. They steal, they are violent, they will hurt you. And the truth of the matter is, the vast majority of black males are not inherently violent, that are not sitting up robbing and stealing. They are actually good fathers. They are actually good husbands. They are actually doing things at a better level, according to statistics, than, than, than their white counterparts. I'll give you a prime example, example of the power of propaganda. I did the video uh, with part one, part two yesterday, and it was about disproportionality of special education, but I mentioned um, studies that have revealed that black men, according to these studies, are actually better fathers than white men and Latino men, and that they are more present and that they will, regardless of their income level, support their children. This is statistically done in studies by very two uh, uh, respectful, uh, respectable and a highly reputable research company, the Pew Research Center and the National Institute of Health. Both published these reports. The CDC has these reports on file. You can look them up. But someone came and asked me, where did I get that information? Why did I state that? And they were very respectful in doing it. And, 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 and they said that uh, they've been told the opposite all of their lives and based off of their experience, that's it's been the opposite well the propaganda machine has created the narrative that black men are irresponsible don't get me wrong there are black men out there screwing up there are black men out there we have a problem with fratricide in our community that doesn't mean that the black on black myth is real it means that we have a problem with fratricide but what i can tell you is just like they love to talk about black on black crime nobody ever says white on white crime despite the fact that 85 percent of white homicides are created by white people you never hear white on white crime why because the propaganda message is to make blacks look like they are literally so violent and dangerous that they kill one another the truth of the matter is homicide and violence in particular in, in in general is a proximal emotional uh, phenomenon. In other words, the vast majority of violent activity and murder happens within the enclave of the people you know the most because they are the most likely to be able to trigger you to a point of anger, to harming them. And so you'll look at any enclave and you'll find that the vast majority of the murders and the violence that happens is going to be perpetrated by someone who looks like them. So the idea that something's wrong with blacks and like black violence is a phenomenon that just simply can't be explained is simply wrong. But it is something that's perpetuated. The same thing that's perpetuated about black fathers. So the guy asked me, where did I get the information? And of course, I shared it. I gave him links to at least two of the studies. I gave him links to the CDC and a couple of other things. But the question question should actually have been is you can immediately question when I say something positive about a black man, but you've in your entire life been told that black men are sorry, trifling, uh, grimy, uh, lazy, deadbeat, never question it, told once that black men are good people and that there are great black men out there and that on average, we are better fathers than white men and immediately question it again. Want to know why? Propaganda. And then the idea is, well, my experience, and I tell people all the time, your experience doesn't have a large enough unit of measure 
uh, for you or sample size for you to determine this is the what the whole behaves like. Uh, even if you are very well connected and you know a bunch of people, you're still dealing with a very small sample size. Let's talk about black men in particular. Adult black men, there are 19.91 uh, million adult black males in this country. The average black average person doesn't know a no no a hundred black males. You may have been in contact with hundreds. You may have went to school with hundreds, but to know, to literally sit up and know how they move and operate in their home, how they deal with their children, how they think, their philosophies, their hardships, their studies, the things that go on, the things that concern them. I can tell you that you may know 10 or 15, but you're judging the entire world on your experience. Your experience is isolated. And while there is a significant issue within the community in single parent homes, in uh, absentee fatherhood, it does not express the totality of the black experience. And to sit up and, and say, OK, because this particular area is a problem doesn't mean that that's the totality of black manhood. And we can't let the narratives be put. This is why in my book, I wrote that one of the things that we've got to learn how to do is start to push our own content. That's another reason why I think it's so important to support the work I do so that we can span content so that we can have our own media outlets so that we can put out positive information so that we can express the truth about who we are so that we can actually say there are men out here doing this. There are women out here doing this. Some of our children are the most exceptional and brilliant kids in that you've ever met we are nowhere in any way intellectually inferior to anyone and matter of fact we are creatively superior in many ways and and and, and we are spiritually inclined over over most in many ways we are rhythmically inclined which means that we naturally have a connection to the normal natural patterns of the universe and how it operates it's so many things that are hidden from us they obscure the truth they distort the truth. They recreate it and present it in, 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 in media. And the thing is, we've been conditioned that if we hear it in media, it has to be true. Democrats have been using media to misinform us for years. We've consistently bought into this lie. And now they've got us trigger trained, which is a part of education. We've been miseducated. We've been trigger trained. We get sleight of hand every election cycle. Whether it's presidents, whether it's Congress, whether it's local, we get we get tri we're trigger trained and we get sleight of hand. What do I mean by trigger trained and sleight of hand? What they do is when they don't have an answer for the questions we are asking, they simply point at Republicans and go racism. And we lose our minds. Racist, racist, racist. And my thing is, I'm not concerned about anything in the way it's labeled. I'm concerned about what can I look at and see progress? What can I look at and say, okay, we are doing better in this area or we're doing better in this area? What I can tell you is that since the Civil Rights Act was passed, and uh, blacks have, uh, without fail, increased voter turnout uh, every election cycle, except for one, the first time, well, the time that Trump was elected. Uh, that was a slight downcline. And then we were blamed for Trump being elected. The truth of the matter is, is that, that the very ones that are constantly talking about being oppressed by men and all of this actually are the ones that voted in the man that said he grabs them by the whatever. And this isn't saying pro anything, anti anything. I'm not Democrat or Republican. I'm about who is going to actually have the balls to stand up and say, I'm going to do something for these people. And I, I, I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And because I am making this promise and this commitment to them. That has never happened. Uh, if you look back, you can go back as far as the early 60s. And you can look and you can see that we've made no progress. Home ownership stagnant. 
single parent households increase. Wealth gap widened. All things that should be showing improvement are showing that we are actually in a worse position. And though we now have more of an illusion that we're doing better, we're driving shiny stuff, we're wearing nice stuff, but the wealth gap is widening. We still have no power to influence our own outcomes. We're constantly still looking to them to solve our issues because that's what the machine, the propaganda machine has told us we have to do. But what do you look at? all of this there has been no increase As a matter of fact some of the most devastating things we've experienced over the last six years has happened under democratic administrations and you, you, you have to ask yourself why the democratic president that that's in office now and again don't get me wrong I have no love for Republicans but I do have love for people who will do and say and mean what they say. I, but I know that Biden said in the 70s he didn't want blacks around his kids. He wasn't he, he fought busing uh, to improve educational and, uh, access and opportunities for blacks with every bitter piece of sweat and blood he had because he didn't want to turn his children's life into a jungle which would what be what, what would happen if he allowed blacks to go to white schools. This is researchable. This is learnable. It's not something I'm making up. You can go pull it up. He fought it. It was this guy who came up with the, uh, the bill, the crime bill of 1994 that gave disproportionate sentences to black people gave a difference in sentencing for cocaine, uh, crack cocaine versus powder cocaine, understanding that the vast predominance of people who are going to be impacted by crack cocaine were going to be poor and predominantly black. So you got people serving 20, 30, 40 years for things that white people now with the heroin epidemic are getting treatment for because of that crime bill. That destroyed communities and homes. It took, kid, it took fathers away from kids. It took away the ability and the capacity for us to rescue our people the way that they're rescuing theirs. And I can go on and on and on. Uh, and this isn't a diatribe about Democrats because Republicans are just the other side of the bird. You have the right wing and the left wing. They belong to the same bird. That bird has been shitting on the head of black people for 400 years. And we have still not understood at a high enough level to actually exact any kind of strategy or agenda that would deliver us from the wrath of this this divide this this divide system these machinations and mechanisms and components of racism that we consistently find ourselves uh being uh maligned by but so when we look at this thing what do we do we have to be the ones who uh manage and monitor the information that is uh bombarding the minds of our youth one of the biggest problems we have now is technology. What do I mean by that? We have children who literally have phones. I've literally been out um, uh, in a restaurant eating and look over and there's a family and that's mom, that's dad, that's the 12 year old, the 10 year old, the eight year old and the two year old. Every last one of them has a device. Every last one of them is on the device. Nobody's communicating with one another. Nobody is having family together in unity time. Everybody's in their own world and everybody's consuming information that they think is good for them. And nobody is sitting up wondering what's going on. And then you say, well, I got these blocks on. Let me tell you something. The one thing kids are great at is getting around the things you put up thinking you protect them. You have to be present. You have to be involved. You have to sit up and say, instead of here, take this. Look, this is what you're going to watch today. This is what you're going to read today. This is what we're going to read as a family. This is what we're going to talk about on Friday. So everybody needs to be familiar with it. You're going to be held accountable for it. We have to be responsible for what we teach our children. We have to be responsible for what it is that we are 
going to expect from the future generations. We love to talk about how entitled this generation is. We love to talk about uh, the lack of progression in this current generation. But what we don't want to talk about is our failure to prepare them. What we don't want to talk about is how we spent so much time trying to give them what we didn't have. We forgot to give them the things that were important that anchored us and they don't have it. And so now we're fighting to instill in them a sense of self, a sense of pride, a sense of identity, a sense of awareness, a sense of history, uh, a connectivity to the values and the interests and principles that govern a, a, a love for us. Because what's happening is it's become an individualized uh, uh value value fest where everybody is focused on what i want as long as i'm happy i don't care what's going on with everybody else as long as i'm winning i don't care what's going on with everybody else it's not bothering me so i don't care and what you don't understand is we live in a social society we are mammals by by our very nature we are social that's why you see every other group in social enclaves even the people who are doing much better than we are individually function with it the enclave and stay on code. Prime example, uh, when Daniel Penny choked out Jordan Neely, it's obvious that that was, that was intentional. 15 minutes uh, when 30 seconds would have sufficed. 30 seconds of choking somebody will render them unconscious if it's done properly. And obviously he had them in a substantial chokehold. And... He did this, and within a 48-hour period, period of him being charged with a crime, he had reared over $2 million, primarily from whites, some misguided blacks, but primarily whites on code. It's just a reaction. It's a response. They understand, even when they disagree with something, that things are operate in this country on a racial caste system. Now you're going to be you're going to hear words like morality. You're going to hear words like spirituality. You're going to hear words like faith. You're going to hear words like Christian and 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 and, and evangelism, but at the end of the day, everybody understands. Matter of fact, when people start talking about the Christianity, like Malcolm said, we can talk Christianity all day long. Sunday is the most the uh, segregated day of the week. It's 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 gotten better because of uh, a bunch of these mega churches that are diverse. But the truth of the matter is, the vast majority of people are having church with people who look like them. So, what 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 do we we have to understand who we are? We have to properly socialize young black minds. Uh, male and female into a sense of love of self, a sense of awareness of how exceptional, how extraordinary, how beautiful and how powerful they are. And we must also take away this awe that is constantly embedded into the psyche and inculcated into the psyche of young black minds, the awe of whiteness. There's nothing special about them. They have an advantage because they created it, not because it's inherent upon them. They are not inherently superior in any way. They simply have the control levers of the system that is currently in power. And if we're ever going to do anything to empower ourselves, we can't demand upon them to give us the levers. We have to create an opposing system of power that we operate and oppose it whenever it infringes upon our space. We must learn how to apply consequences to the actions of those who would infringe upon our freedoms. We, we, we need to stop thinking that you can negotiate with someone and ask them to surrender the very thing that provides them the security, the peace and the tranquility and power that they possess. They benefit from our oppression. They benefit from our poverty. They benefit from our lack of awareness of self. It's our responsibility to empower ourselves by way of knowledge, first and foremost, of self. And then knowledge of how the system works. Then knowledge of how we can create our own systems, our own strategies, our own plans to um, offset what is being put out there in front of us. How do we 
grow as a people, as a unity. We cannot continue down this pathway of individualism. I'm good until you're not. What you don't realize is those who, the one thing that I realized when I started to experience success is that they would tolerate my success, one, because they were probably going to benefit from it because I was probably going to spend. They would also tolerate, tolerate it because of what may happen if they angered the masses by doing something to me. So, and then the more successful you get, that's the reality. Uh, you come with a following. You come with the capacity of information and in news about your life reaching people and influencing how they feel and how they think. What happens when, because you have made it, because you don't have that problem, you sit up and think you're okay? Ask OJ. Ask a bunch of people that fought because they made it they somehow exempted themselves from their blackness only to find out that it was the blackness of the average person that was insulating them. What do I mean? The numbers have relevance. The passion and the connectivity. And the more they convince us to be individualized, the more they convince us that everyone else doesn't matter as long as you're good, the less they have to worry about a collective response to their infringement upon our freedoms. We have to understand that we live in a social world. Everybody operates and advances best when working with one another. And at the core level, there's going to be times where you're going to see this racial caste system in full steam. There are other times you're going to build things with people who don't look like you. Uh, and, and, and I'm not telling you there's anything wrong with that as long as you're protecting yourself and as long as you see that there's a future outcome that you can benefit your family with. You can make alliances in business and you will have to in many instances because there are just things blacks are not going to do to support you. That's not what, what I'm talking about is thinking you don't have to support the growth and development of the black community as a whole will come back to bite everybody because there's going to be an entire generation that comes after you, that comes from you, that's going to be impacted by the decisions you make right now about how you're going to move in the community. No matter how much green you get, you're still black. And it's important to understand that. Look, I am not going to make these things long. Uh, I'm approaching 40 minutes. That's as much I want to do on any one particular of these. Uh, this is going to be part one and part two. Um, so, look, it's our responsibility to change the narrative. It's our responsibility to tell our story, to tell it our way, to illuminate who we are, to liberate ourselves from the suggestions of inferiority, from the suggestions of inherent criminality, from the suggestion of inherent violence, and to understand the things that are driving and creating the realities in our communities that we're seeing and we're experiencing and we're observing. And we need to start creating new imagery for our children, new suggestions, new stimuli, new data for our children. We need to be able to write something that can drive them to exceptional uh, spaces and places so that we can start to see this vision and this idea and this dream that we have of empowerment that we have talked about so incessantly for so long actually start to take root and form but it's going to take a strategy it's going to take plans it's going to take a willingness to move with specificity and not just hope so that's my challenge again as I said at the beginning if you believe in what we're doing, if you believe in the things that we have done, the things we are doing, the things we will continue to do, go to the description box, look in the description box and see how you can give and support the work we're doing, whether it's our research center, whether it's our think tank, whether it's program and program development, whether it's actual program implementation and processes from mental health 
resources to domestic violence and uh, intimate partner violence to childhood sexual abuse, adverse childhood experiences, all of these things we have our hands on. I showed you yesterday where I did a workshop with, uh, and this is what we're going to talk about tomorrow, uh, where I did workshops with um, the Harris County Sheriff's Office and Well Springs uh, Clinic. Uh, on adverse childhood experiences, on epigenetics. And anybody who's followed me knows that epigenetics has been one of the anchors in uh, what I talk about in teaching the about outcomes, especially health outcomes, mental health outcomes, uh, general health outcomes, physical health outcomes. We can tie that to our genetic and uh, our, basically our stress environments and how they uh, impact us genetically. This is one of the ways that we understand how trauma has been passed down generation to generation. While we've been told to forget it because it's been 150 plus years, there has been this constant re-injury, this constant environment of stress that has had a massive impact on our overall outcomes. We need to talk about that as well, but I want you to really support the work we're doing. I think that we can do some unbelievable things in the future. Uh, I'm gonna do whatever I can to leave my imprint in this world, to leave my legacy uh, that I contributed to the empowerment of my people. Uh, I'm gonna do it no matter what, but it would be great to have your support. So again, look inside the description box, click the link and give. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Yeah, yeah. They said I should give it up like that just ain't good enough. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.